Welcome to the Hidden Bookcase. Come through and get cozy. Pick a book, your favourite book, that's the one that opens this room. Inside you'll find a warm fire, a loving cat, and a wide skylight to the stars. And a dangerously high to be red pile. I'm Morgan, I use they-them pronouns, and I am a surprise bodyguard romance. I'm Soren, I use he-him pronouns, and I'm a possibly transmasculine skeleton. I'm Amanda McLaughlin, I use she-her pronouns, and I am a bordering, unhelpful to counterproductive white cat. Soren and I have been friends for over a decade, and the two of us are always swapping books. Each fortnight, the two of us, sometimes with help from a friend, take it in turns to recommend one another a favourite read. The first time reader tells us what they know about the book, makes some predictions about what they don't, and then we discuss our thoughts with all of you bookworms. This month is Necromancy November. So today, let's get to talking about... Sabriel by Garth Nix. So, today we are here with Amanda, who's very thankfully come to join us on the podcast today to talk about Sabriel by Garth Nix, which neither me nor Soren has read. So, Amanda, do you want to tell us where you first found this book and a little like summary of what it's about? Absolutely. First of all, you were kind enough to ask me to talk about my favorite book of all time and to read it. So really, you are doing me the favor, because anytime I can convince somebody to read this book, it's already a win. And letting me just talk at you for quite a while about it is uh, incredibly kind of you. So thank you. But yes, I am a huge fan of Sabriel. It is the first in the Old Kingdom. At first, it was the Old Kingdom trilogy. But over the last almost 30 years since it's been published, more books have come out. So it's now just a whole series. And it's basically a book about a woman who takes over a role from her father as a kind of like emissary to and controller of the dead. In this world, there are, you know, huge forces of very powerful magic that previous people have managed to kind of tame and control. And one half of the world, the world that Sabriel grows up in is mundane, there's no magic there. And as you get closer and closer to the wall, then you are in the land where magic kind of roams and not totally free because it's ultimately very dangerous. But the thing Sabriel can do that nobody else can do in her role as the Abhorson is she's able to use bells to step into death and to go deeper and deeper into the realm of the dead and talk to spirits, sometimes bring them back, though that's pretty inadvisable. And the book opens with her father's untimely death. And she has to step into a role that she's not been prepared for and kind of defend the world against big forces that are trying to claw their way out of death. I love this book. It was published a few years after I was born and I read it just a few years after that. I was like an extremely into reading child. And I also grew up before young adult books were really a genre or a very widespread one. And so when I ran out of kids' books to read, my grandmother, who was the main person like connecting me to books, was like, uh, I don't really know what's appropriate fantasy, I guess. And so Sabriel was one of the books I remember growing up reading. It was really that and um, like the Golden Compass trilogy that was like a fundamental force on me growing up. I definitely feel that on the Golden Compass. I read that at possibly too young an age. There are some mature themes. I was, think I was seven, which is really far too young to be reading The Golden Compass. Like, hey, do you want to think about God and souls in the Catholic Church? Does that be good for you? I remember it distinctly it being the longest book I'd ever read. I was very proud of it. But I'm so excited to hear what you both think about it. Before we do that, should we listen to our blind reaction? Yeah, let's see what we thought of it before we'd read it. Okay, I'm going to go first. We've decided this ahead of time because I think I know nothing about Sabriel and I think Morgan knows many things about Sabriel, having heard about it on spirits, etc. <laughs> which yep. I've not listened to as much as Morgan has. So I'm just going to say what I know. Sabriel, that's the protagonist's name. She's a girl, I think. <laughs> Making a lot of assumptions there, sorry. We have the same cover, I believe, which features a fiery rune of some kind. And we have slightly different covers. You've got more details. My cover is really interesting because it's got this really awful stock image at the bottom. It's quite bad. But then it also has this shiny overlay where if you hold it in certain angles at the line, yes. you can see different runes. I have the same thing, but just without the stock image. Sabriel. She's a girl. She's a necromancer, I think. Or oh, there's a necromancer in this book. That's all I know. I just know that we're doing it for Necromancy in November because Morgan was like, there's necromancy. And I was like, fantastic. I feel like there's going to be lots of scenes in graveyards. That's my prediction. Do I have it like a more Sabriel? Sounds kind of like Gabriel. Maybe she's a fallen angel. There you go. That's my wild prediction. That's all I've got. <laughs> um, I'm going to take my headphones off now and let Morgan talk because I think they know way more. Sauron's headphones are off. So given the cover, I'm guessing that it's going to be set in some sort of sandy desert-like place uh, because I've got more detail on my cover but as to what I actually know about it everything I know is from what Amanda has said 
on spirits because I've listened to I think all of their episodes and she she talks about it a lot which is why I was inspired to invite her on so I know that it's got necromancy because they said it's got necromancy I know that there are bells and they're very important to the magic system and I think maybe they're used to get into the underworld but I'm not entirely sure but that is what I know and my wild predictions are there's going to be a surprise gay character or a surprise trans character. I'm arguing that Throlk is the surprise trans character, by the way. If that wasn't clear by my intro, <laughs> I think he should count. I think Touchstone has real FTM vibes, mm. if, if I may. I agree. Something about the Bastard Prince trope, I think. Just, yeah, <laughs> consistently. <laughs> Oh, it was so good. If your bastard prince isn't trans, what are you doing? Come on. You also mentioned, based on the cover, that you thought it might be set in a desert, Morgan. Yeah. <laughs> desert ice wastes. I mean, there were some scenes in graveyards, but there were also just a lot of scenes in a river, which I don't think is totally obvious from the cover. Yeah, I feel mm. like you could do so much with like river imagery on here. I mean, I love the shiny little charter marks on the cover, but it really doesn't do it justice. The edition that y'all have, I think, was reissued when more books beyond the original trilogy were published. The one I grew up with had a very hot illustration of Sabriel herself on it. But I do just want to bring your attention to the first edition. If that person isn't trans, I don't know who is. But I'm curious, Morgan, and I'm grateful to know that my frenzied pleas for people to learn things about Xavriel have resulted in you knowing something. And for me, the bells felt so different. It's a thing I'm not seeing represented in other books, and I will not be offended at all if you did not think they were cool. But how did this physics and system of magic stand out to you? Is that like a thing that you tend to notice in books? Is that a thing that really interested you? I feel like we're very big on magic systems here. We get very excited about magic systems here. Good. Music-based magic system. Bards. Incredible. No notes. The incorporation of voice into it as a last resort. That little tangent that Sabriel goes on where she's like, of course I can sing because I need to in case I lose my bells. I'm eating that up. I love that sort of like, I think I've called it on the show before, the logical extension of a magic system, following it through to a logical conclusion. Always obsessed with that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The idea that the planes only stay in the air as long as you're whistling. Very cool. When I first read that when I was, you know, like seven or eight, I was like, damn, like I can't whistle. Like I mean, it's never going to work for me. That's exactly the kind of concern that an eight-year-old has reading a fantasy book. Quite like when this happens, it will. What am I going to do? I'm trying to think of other magic systems. I've seen that are anything like this and I can't really think of any that are this innovative. And it's a hard magic system, but it's also a little bit soft, a little bit wishy-washy, but then you've also got the bells and they're all very specific with what they do. I feel like it's the best of both worlds. I really like that each of the bells has personalities. When I first read the Game of Thrones series, I had to like read the book and then close it and then read it again, like immediately, because only by the end of the first book did I sort of learn everybody's names. And that's a thing that's often difficult for me in books, especially when there are like characters with the same letter beginning their first names, things like that. And so the fact that the bells in size and name and in personality and in that kind of level of death that they lead you into is for, you know, again, readers who haven't uh, read the entire book, there are kind of seven levels and seven bells and seven is a very resonant number. But it really helped me to keep track of the sort of mastery of each bell. And like throughout the book, and even throughout the series, we see Sabriel progressing through death, learning her skills. I actually was looking up some articles about Sabriel. There was a bunch of press around the 10th anniversary, including a article on NPR, which was extremely funny to see. And it was like, a teenager looks for her lost father. And I'm like, dude, that is not at all how I would describe this book. But I mean, she is in a certain light. It is a traditional hero's journey and she's learning who she is and what her powers are. And by the end of the book, you sort of see her settle into her new role as the head of a family too. Recently, I've been doing an essay for my my uni course about Arthurian romances and I was applying the structure that they have to modern texts such as Disney's Frozen. Love it. Having just done that essay and then reading this book I was like oh my god and that's the point of disintegration when they realize that the place that they're in is like improper for who they are and they need to move on like a long magical quest and meet lots of different nature spirits and then find themselves and find their knowledge and then come back through all of the steps back to where they were from and bring the knowledge that they have through that. And I was like, oh my God, it's an Arthurian romance. That's so cool. I feel like I'm the only person who'll be like, oh my God, yeah. Medieval English romances. Yes, this book. <laughs> but I'm so glad. And specifically like the chiastic structure of like backwards and forwards motion. I haven't heard that word in many years. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm just, I'm sitting it like a warm bath. Incredible. 
<laughs> what did you guys think of the writing style? That's something that I didn't notice when I first read it because I didn't know enough about books to notice. I was really excited about the story. But I don't know, what did you think? What was the experience of, uh, of reading it like for you? I feel like it's very of its time, not in a bad way at all. It just took me back to the Historic Materials era of fantasy where you have that third person narrator who's a little bit omniscient, but also has a little bit of personality and it's very descriptive. And I really enjoyed it. I think it just had a bit of a nostalgic factor. I actually listened to the audiobook in the end. Oh. And, and honestly, just listening to the narrator with this writing style, I could just literally just lie down and be like, oh my God, I'm a child again. This is great. It's Tim Curry, isn't it? Yeah. I was going to say, voice of my childhood. When I was a kid and my parents had to punish me, they would not allow me to read because that's the only thing that I cared about. So instead, I would listen to the audiobook of Sabriel on my set player, narrated by Tim Curry. So good. I feel like it's really easy to read, but also it trusts the reader to follow it through and it doesn't over explain. It's just the right amount of explanation, especially for like a kid's book. It's not condescending at all. It's just kind of like, you're here along with me. Let's find out what's happening. And I did like occasionally switching to Moggart and Touchstone talking about Sabriel. I really liked those little asides where they're like, we have to protect her. Oh, it really got me. Yeah, because she's kind of unknowable. She's our vessel for exploring the world. She also doesn't know a lot of these things. She's also finding things out as we go through the story. But we don't get a lot of what she's thinking and feeling. She is stoically accepting her duty. And I really like that choice to choose a protagonist that may be a little difficult to get to know or to sort of sympathize or empathize with. I think that's a really good way to put it, Morgan. Nix is trusting the reader to follow this character, even if she's not like bubbly sunshine, telling us all kinds of like quirky character details. I feel like the fan fiction for this book must be amazing. I haven't delved in. This is one of a few rare counter examples to my fanish personality. So perfect in my head that I almost can't touch it. But you're so right. The characters where the outline of them is very solid, but the interior life is sort of rife for speculation. That's where fanfic flourishes, baby. But we have personality to spare in Mogget. I don't have any pets right now, but having a cat named Mogget would be the ultimate slay for me. <laughs> I was reading this in the staff room at my job, which for context, I work in a bookstore and most of my coworkers are sort of like middle age. Every time they saw me like, oh my God, you're reading Sabriel. And then one of my coworkers was like, mock it. That's all I'm going to say to you, mock it. <laughs> <laughs> and then I got to mock it. I was like, mock it. Oh my God. Yeah. How did that reveal play for you? I mean, isn't that the vessel you would want to be uh, sort of, I'm not going to say imprisoned, um, but imprisoned as if you had to be? You know, maybe I'll just take a cat vessel right now. I wouldn't have to go to work. There's so many benefits. I'm envious of my cats every time I have to leave the house. Push things off tables, lie on sofas. I love that Mogget chooses his vessel shape based on the other person he's with. Mm -hmm. And that he sees Saber and he's like, yes, a cat. This teenage girl needs a cat. And he was so right. He was so all right. He saw the witchy vibes. He was like, you know, it would work. But it has to be a white cat to like counterbalance. But also that's his aesthetic, clearly, because he's gone with that in the past. Mm -hmm. He's compromising. I love a good morally grey side character. I love a good morally grey character, period. But especially an unknowable eldritch being who's like, yes, I will be a cat today. It is such a good choice. In rereading the book, it's really the environments of the book that stand out to me as well. And maybe part of this was my vivid child's mind really inhabiting it when I would feel anxious or when I couldn't sleep. In my head, I would walk myself through the abhorsen's house and that journey of the river and the reservoir and going to the wall. The plane comes in at the end. There are so many beautiful images and modes of transport where I sort of characterize myself as a hard fantasy nerd. I love a fantasy book that you have to like manage your money and like, you know, travel miles. I dig that. And this felt like a good mix of you need to get places, but also we're not spending a ton of time tediously watching people walk around. And the sort of differences in environment, we do go from the mundane world in that school, all the way to the Abhorsen's house, which is this vestige of like tradition and mystery, and to battlefields and real kind of like grimy, difficult sites of violent death. Again, was I too young? Perhaps. But I think thinking and talking about death in this way as like a permeable boundary, even if it is flowing in one direction, is something that I also just love and appreciate more and more as I get older. I feel like it's really important to touch on those things, actually. Even as a child, you do think about these things, you ask these questions. Depending on your life, you may have already had experiences with death. I think it touches on those subjects in a nuanced way that isn't... I mean, obviously, it's scary at points, especially if you're a child reading this. Yeah. But those subjects, I think it is the willingness to explore them 
and to question them and to let you sit with them that demystifies them a bit. I feel like also the way that Touchstone and Sabriel both approach death in slightly different ways. Because obviously Touchstone's lost his entire life and everyone he ever knew is dead because it's been 200 years. And then Sabriel has to come to terms with the loss of a parent. How they're both going on those different journeys, but at the same time, I think was really refreshing to see it sort of explored in two different ways and then finding each other together in that. It is. There's also a lot of infrastructure feelings, which I think goes hand in hand with loving hard fantasy. And other books in the series go deeper into the binding. These big unmanageable spirits, one of whom is revealed to be Maga and one of whom Caragor, they bind and kind of conquer by the end of the book. I actually appreciate that it's not a finite ending. Destroying the spirit is not the point. It's about binding them or managing them or like how do we coexist with one another it's really fascinating to hear about the wall and the technology of the bells all of these lines and posts and different ways that the built environment is being constructed to keep people safe for me really felt a lot like being a kid and sort of then seeing the seams of how the world works and realizing that oh like people had to build all these things or people end up living places sometimes by accident but sometimes because they have to realizing that the things you take for granted in the built environment were put there by somebody and for a reason. That's another theme that stood out to me now that perhaps I didn't really realize on the first few reads. The running water aqueduct comes to mind. That was really fun. Sabriel's initial assumption that like, oh, these guys have clearly made some kind of deal with the dead. This is a terrible place. Exactly. Especially going back to the environments for a second. I didn't know that this was urban fantasy but second world urban fantasy and then just talking about blazers and secondary school and the phones and i went hang on a sec (laughs) what's going on here that also took me by surprise i love that contrast between the prologue and the first chapter the whiplash is very fun it sets the scene so well the world building in this in general is so fantastic also the complete lack of exposition there are a couple of times that the narration does pause but by and large it kind of just throws you in and i feel like nix does a fantastic job at really not confusing the reader at the beginning you're having like free magic and charter magic thrown at you and you're kind of like I don't know what either of these things are by the end of it I felt like I had a pretty good grasp on what was going on without at any point the narrative having to grind to a halt to be like here's how this works one thing that stood out to me here is that I had kind of forgotten that she does have a final opportunity to communicate with her father and I almost wish she didn't because while I totally get it for narrative reasons I think the experience of not just that her father is gone and presumed dead and so she has to be the acting abhorson early in the book but that's often how loss goes right it's like you are shocked by it it is unbelievable that this person or this thing is not here anymore and so as an adult it felt like oh man it would have been really something i think for her to conquer that and to just kind of have to wonder like what her dad would think or what he would have to say though story structure and stuff i get it yeah i completely agree with that honestly it feels more like an experience of the classic rescue and then it gets turned into this other thing where it just feels sort of like a sacrifice even though his death was inevitable that is clear on the page it doesn't feel that way it feels like there is that possibility to save him which i guess you could also read of sabriel is in denial from the beginning other people are telling her no you are the apple so now she's like whatever okay after that point the octave was so high there just wasn't a moment for her to sort of breathe which makes complete sense because there was just so much going on that she didn't have time to process it so i don't know if that's something that would come up later in the series but there wasn't a moment for her to actually feel that which i was a little bit disappointed by totally while we are talking on things that we thought could have been done better i wanted more grounding in ancelstia before she went to the old kingdom because when she gets back she's like oh yeah my two best friends this person and this person i'm like who have, have, have we met them am i supposed to care that they're dead now um what i feel like i needed more of her being like i have to leave these people behind now i'm bringing danger back to these people who i've grown up with and now it's kind of my fault that they're dead if we'd been given more of that before we went tearing off to the old kingdom it would have been so much more impactful i kind of felt that with her relationship with her father as well because we didn't really get to see them actually interact until that moment when they reunited we see the birth scene and then we jump to she's in college and he's already missing it is fun to start the story immediately with the call to action and you know i love a vague prologue that makes more sense in retrospect maybe even a flashback scene some cute little flashbacks Right, exactly. Yeah, like as the headmistress calls her into the office to say like, this is the situation, good luck, remembering all these little things about her dad and what he said. At least for me, like I'm always having echoes of what a loved one who has died would say or think, especially with all of the auditory themes in this book, I think would make a ton of sense for those words or melodies to echo through your head. Just like a thing of like, oh, this is a song that he taught me. And now it's saving my life. I have to ask the dreaded question that I feel like we'll all struggle to answer. Mm. 
who was your favorite character? I mean, definitely Sabriel. Maybe that's basic. Maybe that's what the book intends. But I see a lot of her in myself and vice versa. Like there are parts of her that I dislike that I recognize in me. And there are parts of me that I wish would look more like her. And maybe it's just not possible to separate such an early influence from the person I ended up being or wanting to be. But that is true for me. However, the scenes with Mocket in them shine with an energy that no other scenes in the book have. So it's a toss up between those two for me. I think that's so true that when you read something at such a formative age, because we did childhood favourites last December on the show. And I think we both picked the protagonist when we were talking about our favourites. It's hard not to. Yeah, they've become a little bit intertwined with you. I think my favourite character was Touchstone. Mm. Tell me more. There's just something about that trope. The stoic bodyguard character who's suddenly lost the cause that they have been fighting their entire life for and has to find something new to believe in. And finding that belief in this girl, very much that sort of, I will dedicate my life to you. and we're perfect together because we have the different aspects of what we need in this world covered. And he was just so, he's just so good. He's just there being like, I have my sword. I'm kind of the king, but that's not really important. Mm -hmm. We love a man who simps. Yeah, he's a real wife guy appreciative, especially in later book, they refer to Sabriel and Touchstone as the abhorse and Sabriel and King Touchstone. Like he comes second every time and I'm like, damn, all right. Yes. (laughs) Mrs. and Mr. Abhorson. Exactly right. Yeah, Dr. and Mr. Abhorson, yeah. Soren, who's yours? I feel like it is Nogat. It has to be. He was just so much fun. The scene where he just gets really high on catnip and is useless as a result. So good. Fantastic. <laughs> so glad that Nogat decided to include this in the narrative. It's a very tight narrative, and he was like, this is necessary. We need Nogat flailing around. And I think also, I was a little bit struggling at the start just to concentrate, just because I had a lot going on. I was very busy. I was trying to keep this on breaks at work. When one character has the flaw, it can be difficult, I think, to stay engaged. It's why it's so rare to really have one character alone. I've seen it in more than this for Patrick Ness, which I think does a fantastic job of it. And I do think Sabriel is able to hold your attention. But as soon as Moget was there for Sabriel to bounce off when that dynamic was there, it just sped up for me. I do feel a little bit like I am betraying my actual favorite character in this entire series, who is the protagonist of the second book, Lyriel, which is absolutely stunning. But this is a very necessary introduction to the world. And I think the main reason why this is a series that I remain so attached to is really because of the entire world. The character's journey are compelling, yes, but I care about this world and what happens in it and what happens to it almost even more than I care about individual characters, which to me is really interesting because I think as people we are so focused on the journeys of individual characters and less so what happens to this universe? What happens to this plan? Like, is this infrastructure going to hold? I don't know. It's just fascinating. I think part of it is the vividness. It just feels so lived in. Like the tavern that they stop at, which I'm forgetting the name of, the three lemons or the the lemon tree. I can't remember what precisely it's called. The tiny little details of like all of their clothes smelling of lemons afterwards because they use lemon soap. It just feels very tangible, which I think gives that weight where you're like, oh, I don't really want this to be destroyed by an army of the undead, please. I've actually grown quite fond of it, even in a very short space of time. Yeah, like Touchstone didn't get turned into a boat for 200 years for nothing. (laughs) Oh, the little bit where he's like, oh, I was always supposed to die down here. It just came 200 years too late. Heartbreaking. I know. I need a book from his point of view of him being like, I feel like I should still be a boat right now. Where's the water? (laughs) You've got to read Unraveler, which does include a character who used to be a boat discussing how he feels sort of like dysphoric in his human body because he used to be a boat. It's on the list. And should you end up reading Abhorson, you get to see a little bit of the like, I do sometimes still wish I was the figurehead of a boat vibe, which I, I really love. You just want to be a cat or a figurehead of a boat. The two best things to be. So perhaps the most identifiable quote of this book is, does the walker choose the path or the path the walker? Which I think kind of makes no sense at all. It doesn't really resonate with me. What do you guys think? Yeah, I'm not sure how well it works as a metaphor because you're personifying the path, which is kind of confusing. Maybe. Yeah, and like, death's gonna take us all, man. Like, that's the path we're all on, but it's, that, that's not really the point. And Sabriel doesn't resist her destiny. So like, why are we why are we talking about this? She's a very active character. She kind of like vaguely hears the call to adventure and immediately sprints off in the direction of a whisper. What do you think, Morgan? I feel like it's one of those classic like, oh, we have to talk about fate now. Here's a quote for that. It's definitely a vibe. Certainly could put it on a mug, could put it on a t-shirt. I know. Is he thinking about like merchandisable lines or opportunities? I'm not sure. I feel like I have to shout out the final line of the book. I just really loved how it ended. It's just like, yeah, I am alive. Great. I don't really know how to go on from here. I didn't really think I was going to survive that. And now, now I have to plan for the future. I have to get a job and do taxes. What? Hello? 
Yeah, I feel like that resonates a lot. I feel like I do also have to say the um, I love you, I hope you don't mind. Yes! <laughs> oh my god. I'm happy standing over here and just watching you lovingly, even if you don't reciprocate. And it's just so soft. You both are totally right. It mortified me reading this again, how much I imprinted on that as like the most romantic way to declare yourself to somebody. I was like, oh God, like I've really, I really found myself echoing those words before. We become what we read, right? Like the books we read become us and Lord, I, I became that. There weren't a ton of lines that stood out to me. It's more the images, the descriptions. Those are things that I loved. I actually love that the prose almost doesn't get in the way. Easy reading is hard writing, right? Like I know that Nick chooses his words very carefully and like other books, I feel the lyricism or the literary choices more. But in this, even just like a random sentence, like he choked, comma, looked surprised, comma, and then tried again. That's touchstone for speaking. The no nonsense perspective makes those moments like you talked about Morgan where you know Sabriel was really surprised that she was alive like those notes do stand out so much more to me I really jive with it but the descriptions of the bells and the rhyme about the charter and just the phrase charter preserve us too I'd sort of forgotten about that and I am an absolute sucker for exclamations and curses and blessings in fantasy worlds they really bring that stuff to life for me my final thoughts. I had a really good time reading this. It did have that nostalgic quality. It felt like reading a fantasy novel from my childhood, which was really nice. I think I would have absolutely eaten this up as a kid. It's a shame that Baby Sauron probably wouldn't have picked it up because it has so much death in it and I was terrified, but you know, maybe it would have helped. <laughs> so I think I should have. And I'm very, very excited to see where the rest of the story goes. Loved the world building, liked the characters. Do you think that there are little things that could have been improved, which is why I think I'm going with a four star here, that I had a good time overall? Morgan? I very casually give out five stars in this show, left, right and centre. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it's a, it's a five star. Yay! Enjoyed it a lot, just wandering around, reading the audiobook and just having so much fun cooking my pasta. It really subsumed me and I read it quite quickly because of that. Very nostalgic, very vibey. I got what I wanted. I got what it said on the tin. I got necromancers. I got bells. I got a surprise little romance. I got a cat. Literally, that's all I need, to be honest. So a uh, nice five stars, solid five stars. Do I rate as well? Yes. I can't be objective. This is a fully subjective five out of five. If I were making a wall memorializing the influences on my personality, this would be like, you know, top two, three books at least. I am so delighted that you both tried it. Thank you for doing that. I hope that anybody who reads it finds it compelling and interesting. And I hope that you also read on to Lyriel, a book literally about a girl who lives inside a library that could not be more relatable for I'm guessing 100% of the people listening to this podcast. And if you're like, Mogget, great, but I'm not a cat person. Excellent news, Lyriel's got a dog. So it, it, it helps everybody here. For people that liked Sabriel, do we have any recommendations? I was contemplating my bookcase before this, trying to figure out what I was going to recommend. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm going to start off with Vespertine by Margaret Rogerson. I've recommended it on the show before. It's a YA book about a girl who lives in a convent and the entire world is haunted by ghosts. 500 years ago, there was a huge war and all of the undead came back to life. And now it's her job to just prep bodies. And she was possessed as a child. And then she gets possessed by this really high powered revenant who just kind of goes, you live like this? And just teaches her self-care. And she teaches it about anxiety. It's a very cute friendship, classic journey through this world. And it felt very similar. There's necromancy, but also it's very journey based and sort of learning about yourself and coming to terms with the world and yourself and your place in it. It has a very, very similar vibe. You know, Morgan really inspired me and I'm going to recommend watching Avatar The Last Airbender and The Legend of Korra. I know it is a non-book, but it feels so expansive and it gave me so many of the feelings of discovery and joy and adventure. There is someone who's been asleep for a long time, wakes up. There is a young woman who is perhaps not totally suited to the role she's in, but has to do it anyway. And I think if you like parts of these magic systems, there is a lot more physicality of like hard magic, but with personality, medium well magic, maybe, that I think you can enjoy in Korra and Avatar. It is a book that we have done on this show before. But I was going to recommend The Starless Sea by Erin Morgenstern because of the sort of post apocalyptic feel of it, where you are coming into this world and you kind of feel like it's had its heyday, it's had its zenith, and you're coming to it a little bit late and basically just trying to stop it from falling apart. And I guess it's also set in a library, so if you like the series, The Old Kingdom, more library. 
Perfection. I do want to give a quick plug as well to Garth Nix's The Seventh Tower series, which if you're like, okay, bells, whatever, that's nice. But light really gets you going, gets you really excited. You gotta do The Seventh Tower series. It is a lot more like cerebral. I think it's, it's a lot less focused on the world is in peril. If you were like, hey, I, I kind of jive with this. I want to see what else this man's twisted mind in the Australian outback has come up with. Consider The Seventh Tower series. My husband, Eric, and I read it when we were, those are the two books I brought on a vacation where there was like an Arctic vortex in the Netherlands when we were visiting and we essentially could not go outside for the week. So we sat in a very sparse Scandinavian Airbnb and read The Seventh Tower series and it was great. So. I recommend that. Amanda, it was so, so much fun to have you. If people want to hear more of you, where can they find you? I am a podcaster and I make several shows, one of which you very kindly mentioned, Spirits, which is a long running podcast I host with my best friend, Julia, about mythology and folklore. So we talk about all kinds of stories from all around the world and urban legends from our hometowns and much, much more. That's at spiritspodcast.com. And I am also a player on Join the Party, which is a fantastic improvisational storytelling podcast with sound design and music that's powered by the rules of Dungeons and Dragons. And we spend so much time thinking and talking about world building and character and where power comes from. And our DM, Eric Silver, who is also my husband, does a fabulous job of pulling from interesting news sources. So whether you're curious about role playing games and content, or you're all about it, or you're kind of like, meh, like, I don't know if that's really for me, I think Join the Party will be for you. So check that out at jointhepartypod.com. Whenever people are trying to get into D&D and they ask me what podcast to listen to, I'm always like, join the party. Great for introducing you to the world and to how the game works. And also Eric's conscientious world building is something that really, really gets me. Yeah. Thank you. Oh my gosh. I care so much about it. There, there are so many things reminding me. Actually, there is a lot of touchstone in the character I'm playing in our current campaign. And uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go reflect on that because I think he was a real inspiration that I, I didn't really realize until right now for Troy Riptide. So next time, we will be following up our Gideon and Hara episodes, finally getting Soren to read Nona the Ninth by Tamsin Ware. And we will be having Zoe on to guest again. If everyone doesn't know Zoe, go back and listen to the two episodes because they have some brilliant takes about the unhinged lesbian necromancers and we finally get to possibly the most unhinged of the three books which after harrow is possibly impossible but you know that's saying something and until then you're always welcome through the bookcase don't forget to scratch the cat on your way out thank you for listening to the hidden bookcase a production of planar prod on this episode you heard amanda mclaughlin morgan greensmith and soren briarwood discussing sabriel by garth nix you can find out more about this book at garthnix.com and you can follow nix on twitter at garth nix a huge thank you to Amanda for joining us for this episode. You are a real bell. You can follow her at She's So Mickey on Twitter, find out more about Spirits, a boozy podcast about legends and folklore at spiritspodcast.com, and check out genre bending actual play podcast Join the Party at jointhepartypod.com. You can find the Hidden Bookcase on Twitter at Hidden Bookcase and on Instagram, Tumblr, and TikTok at Hidden Bookcase Podcast. Find out more about Planar Prod at planarprod.com. Know what we should read next, or want to chat to us about what you thought of this episode to read? You can reach us at thehiddenbookcase at gmail.com, send us a DM on social media, or come chat with your fellow bookworms in our growing Discord server. The link is in the show notes. Want to support The Hidden Bookcase? Support us on Patreon for bonus episodes every month, outtakes, playlists, and other extras. Buy a book through our bookshop.org page linked in the show notes. Or consider leaving us a rating or review or telling a friend how to find us. Your whispers are the best way for bookworms to discover our show. On our next episode, which will be out on Monday, 20th of November, we will finally be discussing Nona the Ninth by Tamsin Ware, with Zoe Davis, of course. We hope to see you then, and in the meantime, you're always welcome through The Bookcase. <laughs>